Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Rams Review podcast, Um, a special edition. We're going to review probably the biggest game of the season uh, against Portsmouth and none better than a guest to talk about the the clash of the Titans and potentially the the league title decider, other than Andrew Mitramore from the PO Forecast. Good evening, Andrew. Good grief. You suddenly made me nervous. Good evening. How are we doing, Chris? Clash of the Titans. I've that's that's put the fear into me a little bit. I've never thought that about a League One game before, but I suppose this season you're probably right. Well, well, to be fair, I think we're the only two teams that get more than five people at the games because uh let's be honest, League One has been um in some elements of what I've seen so far, park football at, at, at worst, it's been pretty awful. But hey, let's move on. More trouble, Chris. Bits. I mean, j- just saying, we came to it from opposite directions. We came up from League Two. You you came down from the champ. <laughs> I'm telling you, there is worse out there. Even if you know Burton brought twelve fans the other week on a Tuesday night. To be fair to them, to they're a good twelve. But trust me, it it does get even worse as you go down the pyramid. So I'll caveat that straight away. <laughs> how, how bad was it in League 2 while you are there? What 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 were the challenges in that league? Uh, when someone kicked the football out of the stadium, you had to await a decent amount of time for another football to get found. <laughs> that was that was less than ideal when we were having real financial problems sort of 10 or so years, just under 10 years ago. Honestly, the, the quality was low, uh, obviously, and... It's just such a difficult league to get out, out of. You can't play attractive football on a lot of those pitches because, you know, the, the quality of the pitches aren't great, uh, to, to put it mildly, just because of financial constraints. And, I mean, for for the first couple of seasons in that league, we were playing with a lot of kids uh, for various well-documented reasons. So we had sort of eight 16-year-olds and then three 36-year-olds. And the 16-year-olds would just get out-muscled. It's such a different type of football, even to League One. It's visually very different to watch in terms of the physicality nature of it uh so yeah it's a a nightmare of a league we were thrilled to get out probably we feel about league two the same way you feel about league one i would imagine uh, and we have started feeling it about league one as well because we've been here now longer than we were in league two for so hopefully we'll both be gone in what a month's time 27th of april's final game of the season that's what four weeks tomorrow or something so at the time of recording so Hopefully we're in the, the home stretch. That'd be nice, yeah. wouldn't it? I'll take your take your handshake on that if you offer it now. <laughs> well, we'll we, we'll both shake our hands, and uh, I think we should just ring the FL now. So we've agreed that you can have the championship as long as we can have second, and the rest. Can... I'd, I'd offer the same deal. I'll, yeah, I'll just split it with you. Have it, have it six months each. The, the trophy in our our museums and um or wherever they would keep it. I don't even know where would we would keep it, but yeah, six months each. Split the title. Split the prize money, both go up. Bish bosh. See you, Bolton. I'll take I'll, that. I'll send Mr. Birch a WhatsApp and see what he says later. Um, just just while we're talking about Portsmouth and before we get on to the nitty-gritty of, of, of the game ahead, what is your ownership status now? Because I remember uh, in years gone by that the fan supporter group sort of took it over and, and rescued the club and you, you've got some infamous fans and a, a fantastic heritage down there and what is the status now of the club? Is it is it on on safe shore? Should we say? Yeah, yeah, it's it's so stable. Which is again, I hope this doesn't come back to bite me. I can't see a universe in which it would. So yeah, the PST ended up being bought out. Uh, Portsmouth Supporters Trust ended up being bought out by the Eisner family from the US. So the Eisners used to run, I want to say Disney um, and ESPN. I think they they were the Michael Eisner was the CEO of. Uh, in years and decades gone past and they've brought in a lot of stability so we've not gone down that sort of Wrexham route of throwing money at things and doing it in a very American glitz and glamour way with Hollywood although we did have Will Ferrell at one of our games which was a bit of an odd experience he went into the changing room after the game and I genuinely don't know how the players responded to that it was an odd one but um, I digress yeah so it's a lot more stable now the I think the Eisners have put a total of about I think it was our, our our club financial statement for the previous year came out, I think, yesterday. And the Iceland have now put about, I think it's 35 million or so into the club. And just little things like around Fratton Park, the away end, uh, your your fans will potentially notice is, is nicer than it was, I think, last time you visited in terms of the general environment, in terms of the area behind the away end, in terms of the quality of the actual stand. It's improved. It's had a, a new lick of paint as well. 
and just the, the sustainability of the club is now there because the PST is incredible. It still is. And the club literally would not exist without them. But in terms of fan ownership, there's a unfortunately a, a realistic view that, you know, there's a bit of a ceiling to it. And the PST stabilised everything as we needed them to. And I can't speak highly enough of them. And they're still doing excellent work, even though they don't, you know, actually run the club anymore. They're still doing excellent work alongside the club and being consulted and such like. And the Eisners have, have really come in and rather than doing it as a, almost a, a hostile takeover where they do what they want, there is quite a lot of consultation. There's quite a lot of openness. Uh, we've got Rich Hughes in as a director of football who just does a fantastic job. Um, the, the recruitment side of things has been good in the staff and the player side. Honestly, other than the academy side of things and not having an, an under-23 side, no real route from the academy up to the first team squad and quite a high culling rate. Other than that, I, I don't have a bad word to say about the organisation of the club now, irrelevant of whether we go up or not. We've got good people through the door in the staff, in the ownership, in the coaching. And I, I won't go on about it too long because I doubt Derby fans want to hear too much about the <laughs> the internal processes of management of game day experiences at Portsmouth Football Club. But yeah, it, we're we're on a safe footing now and I would trust them not to overspend and put us in a position where that would be in jeopardy, which is, you know, after the, the seven, eight years we had is I can't pay bigger praise to them, to be honest with you. So uh, I remember last year, Portsmouth were probably the hardest team to beat in the league and uh, I think became the draw specialist, which isn't a bad thing when you have a, a coach take over and steady the ship. Um, what's changed? Uh, has there been money being put into the club that's allowed Messino to to invest? I, I remember, I'm sure at the start, the, the first window, you signed as many as 14 or 15 players. I think you went a bit bonkers for a while. Or, or has it been his coaching? Or, or what was the general opinion of, of what's made Portsmouth from a, a team very difficult to beat to now? A team that very rarely loses yeah it's a really good question to be honest with you and i probably don't have a nice simple answer to put to put my finger on it if i did i'd probably work for the club uh, in, a, in a more formal capacity but i think in terms of the the type of manager that the, the club has now got john messino a complete unknown quantity when he came in first full-time managerial gig you know, we, we picked him up from oxford united where i think he was still a squad player a center back when we picked him up and you know, we were talking about Chris Coleman and that type of thing as potential managers. And then we got blindsided completely by him coming in. But in terms of sort of the emotional approach to the game, he seems like a very happy medium between the two previous managers in Kenny Jacket and Danny Cowley. And that Kenny Jacket was very, you know, poker face. You felt like there was a big divide between him and the fan base and didn't show much emotion on the touchline. I want to. I think it was Norwich in the FA Cup. I watched it from New Zealand, so it must have been the end of 2018, maybe? Around Christmas, New Year, we beat Norwich in the FA Cup last minute, and it was on Kenny Jacket's birthday, and his press conference afterwards looked like someone had just stolen all of his pets. Like, he looked absolutely, <laughs> like, just deadpan. And then we went a little bit too far the other way, I think, potentially, and I don't actually have anything bad at all to say about the Cowleys. They, they're really good blokes like the best blokes and I hope they succeed at Colchester and I think the Pompey fan base was gutted it didn't work without what didn't work out with them at us but they're very much sort of emotions on the sleeve very arm around the shoulder and and that works for some type of player but they it sounds a cliche but they lost the dressing room a bit I think because of the unerring positivity and there were a couple of days where, you know, it was it was almost the Steve McLaren with an umbrella thing where it had been hammering down with rain. We'd lost 2-0 away from home and you just felt so sorry for him, trying to find positives, uh, you know, looking soaked through on the touchline, just, you know, give him a waterproof coat, for goodness sake. <laughs> and Messino is sort of that middle ground of pragmatic, calm, not too high, not too low. Very, very good managerial style, speaks well, tactically, has shown in a couple of games this season, he's very astute and picks up on things on the touchline that some of which we pick up on from the stand, but we're higher up, so it's probably easier for us to pick up on certain positional things. But he picks up on on things on the pitch and changes mid-half, doesn't wait for the next break in play, which we haven't always had. Um, and then, I mean, the actual, the formation is is very similar to what we played under Kenny Jacket, utilising wingers. Like we had Jamal Lowe 
Um, and Ronan Curtis is our wingers under jacket. Jamal Lowe has gone to succeed in the championship. So the system's not entirely different, but the quality of player is higher. Having Bishop and Yengi playing, you know, at nine, and then Paddy Lane and, and Abu Kamara on the wings have just they've exceeded all expectations, to be honest with you. And there's just a positive feel around the club. And I, I don't know how they've got the mentality there, but there were so many games early in the season when we scored late, as as your fans well know that. But that wasn't a it wasn't an anomaly for us. That was a point in the season where we were doing that regularly. It was something like seven out of ten games we scored in the last ten minutes. And there's that sort of never say die. And you know, you you never write a game off, even two nil at Reading in the first twenty minutes where we were all through no pun intended, we were thrown by the tennis ball protests. You didn't really think that game was over at 2-0 down and we came back and won 3-2. And that was around the same time as we played you. And there's just this mentality where the players don't don't give in, they don't stop. And I don't know where it's come from, but it speaks volumes about what's going on behind the scenes in terms of having a good feel around the dressing room. Do you, do you find that complacency has come into the team yet? Do you think now that I've uh, been, pl been playing in a style that they they walk onto the pitch and they think that the buffer is enough to get them home? You know, certainly uh, as, a, as a Derby fan and you've seen um, some strange results that we've had, uh, i.e. the Northampton one being the last one. Have Pompey also had that? Uh, because I remember that you had a, a bit of a blip sort of early winter where you were you were running away with the league and I think it, then you, you sort of didn't win one in four or five and everyone was thinking as the as the bubble burst how's the season gone yeah I mean the Christmas New Year blip is just you know the sky is at the moment grey grass is green Pompey have a little meltdown at Christmas that's just it's what we do it's kind of part of our USP and it's kind of endearing once you get used to it for 50 well I'm 32 once I've got used to it for 25 years in a row you just you learn to love it um, but not at, only with hindsight, <laughs> not at the time. So yeah, the Christmas New Year blip. I don't think at any point it's been down to complacency. To be honest with you, there have been a couple of very weird results in terms of dropping points. At, you know, Fleet against Fleetwood, dropping points against Cheltenham, and I think the games where we have most dramatically dropped points. So the de defeat at defeats at home against Blackpool that was a four nil defeat, and the defeat at home against Leighton Orient that, from memory, was a three nil defeat. Both of those were just tactical issues. There wasn't complacency. There were large tactical issues on the pitch that weren't able to get solved during the game. So Blackpool, they targeted left-back position where we had Jack Sparks playing, who isn't great in the air. And then they just won every second ball on the knockdown and had a two-on-one versus our left-sided centre-back. Leighton Orient, they had um, Shaq Ford and Dan Adji just sit... well. Dan Adji just sitting just in front of our back four and just creating space. They had people sitting in that little pocket between our two banks of four and we couldn't cope with it. And both of those games, we were multiple goals down. Actually, to be fair, Blackpool, we conceded more later on after I think it was a red card for Joe Morell in that game. But both of those games were just a bit of a... We had no momentum and you could see from the first 15 minutes they were going to be a struggle. I wouldn't say that complacency has been an issue at any point. There have been times where it just hasn't worked out tactically. And yeah, the teams that sort of lower in the league that have taken points off us, Cheltenham had a bit of a random three-minute spell where they, I think they scored twice in three minutes. I can't remember who it was, but yeah, I don't think it's been complacency, to be honest with you. I, I, it's a criticism that I wouldn't level at them. The season as a whole is, you know, I'm not going to complain about it. We're sitting top with seven games to go. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's been a monumental disaster because that would be fairly, uh, fairly insane. But um there are always going to be ups and downs. 46 games is a long time, isn't it? And um, yeah, to, to have that blip over Christmas and we've still only lost four out of the 39 is just testament to what they've done outside of that little blip. And they've always bounced back from those results as well, where there has been, a, you know, you think heads could go down, we could get onto a bit of an iffy run here and the teams could, you know, reel us in. There's been a reaction, whereas previously under Danny Cowley, when things went started going downhill, they continued going downhill like a snowball, gathering speed and gathering sort of um, gathering momentum, and that's just not happened as yet this season. Touch wood, it doesn't. So, looking at uh, your last lineup against uh, 
Well, the one I've picked out is, is the important game you had against Peterborough where uh, I think you sneaked a 1-0 win. And looking at your formation, it, it yep. says here that you play a, a tradition of 4-2-3-1. Is that, is that the case at home as well? Or is that purely a, a, an away tactic? Um, it, I see a couple of names in there that are familiar. Marlon Pack for, for one. Do, does Messino tend to tinker between home and away visits? Or or is it uh, is it normally a regular... Uh, formation week in week out it will generally be a 4-2-3-1 we we have experimented a little bit with three at the back with limited success I think the last time we really went with three at the back was trying to see out the game against Oxford and we conceded an equaliser last minute and uh, the first half of that game I think we played three at the back and it was just probably the most boring half of football we've had this season. So and we also don't have enough fit centre-halves of a League One quality to really execute it. So if we're playing three at the back, then it means that in all likelihood there's been an injury, potentially in the Wickham game that we don't know about yet, or an injury on the training ground. So I'd, I'd, I'd very much expect this to be 4-2-3-1. We're a little bit limited injury-wise, as I mean, I know you can be as well, <laughs> but uh, Christian Sadie, who played in that, game against Peterborough, he is uh, likely to be... Well, he's out of the game against Wickham, so he's not playing Good Friday. Don't know if he's going to be back for the game against you. It was a, a mild hamstring issue I think he went off with. Cassini Yengi, who scored in that game against Peterborough, since that game he's gone out and played internationals in Australia. So he's an Aussie who he scored his first international goal for Australia against Lebanon. So he's flown back. I'd be surprised if he starts against Wickham uh, tomorrow at time of recording. Yeah. Purely because of the travel. Jet lag normally isn't that bad coming westbound from Oz. It's worse going over there. But I still, you know, it's a bloody long way, isn't it? So he he might be a little bit tired. But we will start 4-2-3-1. Uh, in that Peterborough game, we had sort of Piet Harris but, uh, starting on, on the, the left. I don't... I'd imagine that Abu Kamara will start... And Paddy Lane will start on the on the left. Lane missed that game because of illness. I think he had some sort of sickness or fluey thing that's going around. So what I'd expect based off our injuries, if we don't pick up any more between now and then, is same four at the back possibly, as we did against Peterborough. Um, and then Hack and Moxon both playing centre defensive midfield. I would expect Lane and Kamara to be the wingers on the three. And the 10 is where we've got a bit of a question mark, where Sadie played in that Peterborough game. Um, if Sadie isn't back, I'd potentially expect Pierre Harris to fill in there. Um, however, Pierre Harris has been moved to eight in a couple of games recently. There is the possibility that Bishop could drop into a 10 and Yengi could play up top, which is what we did in the last stages of that game against Peterborough. I don't know if he'll play them both from the start. I think that limits our impact sub options if Yengi and Bishop both start. It's been unusual for them to be on the pitch at the same time this year. We we've, we've played them with two at the top, two up top together, maybe twice all season. Once when we were drawing one all against Bristol Rovers and we conceded late, but they did actually create opportunities. And then yeah, once in this Peterborough game. Uh I don't know if that answers your question. So I'd expect it to be fairly, fairly similar. Assuming we don't pick up any more injuries between now and Tuesday, yeah, I think I think looking at Derby, we have a, a an injury list. I think it's now into double figures, um, or it depends. Like we having a, a conversation pre-recording based on you know what you hear in the press, and then all of a sudden Mendes Lang has had uh, some some magic tonic rubbed on his leg and. Yeah, he's, it's, he's gone full Lazarus, hasn't he? Maybe yeah, well, <laughs> apparently he's gone from having a severe uh, season-ending injury to some bruising on some form of scar tissue. So who knows what to believe. Um, so just quickly touching on you, you were talking about your, your injury list itself. Does that impact the starting eleven to the point where your bench is very weak and you're going to rely heavily on the first eleven, Or, or do you think that if things aren't going quite right on Tuesday night, you've got enough off the bench to to, to change formation, change uh, strategy? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question. It's good. I think the the depth we have isn't where it was six months ago. I think our squad on paper, if everyone was fit, is night and day, night and day 
deeper than previous seasons. Having said that, we're a little bit light on the ground. Honestly, it's probably position dependent. In play, positions like right back, where we've got Zach Swanson and Joe Rafferty, both of them walk into most League One starting lineups in the right back position. So if one of those gets injured, obviously it's not, it wouldn't be ideal, but there is someone to come on who is just as capable in that position. On the wings, again, there's a decent amount of depth, probably not to the same quality. But Josh Martin, who's on the bench, who he hasn't really torn up any trees since he arrived. He's been sort of that solid, but not spectacular. He'd been training us with us for quite a long time before he got offered a contract this side of the new year. Um, and Lee Evans has come in, who we've not really seen a huge amount of yet. He was at Ipswich previously. So on the wings, again, decent amount of depth there. Goalkeeper, Will Norris starting, who has just had a fantastic season. I think most clean sheets in the league. But then subs bench, you've got Matt Macy, who I, I think... I think that's who you were referring to on our pod when you said you yeah. were impressed by our keeper yeah. last year. That's Matt Macy, who's come back and isn't even starting now. Is that a six so, foot? Is it six foot five? Six oh, foot six? Yeah, he's a giant, he's isn't he? Yeah, absolute giant. So, in certain positions, yes, there's depth. Centre back, probably less so. Uh, we've got Shocknessy and Raggett playing there at the moment. Raggett's done fantastically to come in, and I say he's probably playing above the level that most people, myself included, gave him credit for to be playing in a top of League One side and performing well. Uh, Riley Towler on the bench. I think he's got a good ceiling, but he's quite young and hasn't had a huge amount of minutes. And he's tended to come on late to try and defend a lead and it hasn't always worked out well. So he's who came on against Oxford United when we were 2-1 up with 10 to go and we conceded 90th. So I wouldn't be as confident if one of our centre-backs picked up an injury. Gavin White, to be fair, can can come on on the wing as well and he's growing in confidence I'd, I'd say it's a, there's a slight step down for the most part, with the exception of if Yengi or Bishop are on the bench to come on as impact subs, or if Sadie's on the bench. I'd say, yeah, probably a, a slight step down on our wings and at centre-back, but sort of the spine of the team, that goalkeeper, centre midfielder up top, that it's not a step down. So, yeah, probably quite position-dependent. That's a very vague answer I think I might have just given you there but no, I mean, very it, position dependent it, it sounds very similar to the situation we're in as a as, as a as a team as a squad um five months ago out Paul Warm sorry five games ago even Paul Warm saying we had the strongest bench he, he, he'd ever had even as a manager and now you look at the bench we had against Northampton and we had some uh, under 23s on there and you know as you know with the administration and we didn't have any under 23s in, in in the building two years ago so it sort of tells you that the level that where they're at although I'm probably doing a disservice to Ben Ratcliffe who is a, an up-and-coming talent so just a final couple of questions to, before I wrap it up um who's your who's your player to watch and who potentially do you think has got a mistake in them to uh to sort of give your your killer's heel a good uh good hit I I mean key players to watch I think in terms of actually enjoying watching just outstanding football players I think you you'd have to look at Paddy Lane it's genuinely been a privilege to watch him and I don't that sounds very fanboy but the quality he's got and the improvement we've seen from him I think when he first he came to us uh, from Fleetwood and one of those signings that you know we it didn't get people too excited when he signed you know up and coming player has potential etc but the fact that the level of improvement in his play in terms of his first touch and his finishing, I think when we played against you even last uh, earlier this season, he had a couple of chances and he was getting almost yeah. a bit of a reputation for being a little bit wasteful in front of goal and sort of getting into good positions, but his first touch would let him down or he'd you know miss a good opportunity. And honestly, I cannot describe to you the, the journey he's been on since then in terms of his first touch in terms of his game intelligence and in terms of his finishing, I have no idea what's happened behind the scenes, but he's probably the one to watch in terms of just being an outstanding football player. Uh, Abu Kamara on the other wing, very one foot dominant, very reliant on his, on his left. Having said that very, very good on his left. So he has had games where he struggled to make impact when he gets doubled up on and just shown onto his weaker foot, kind of gets negated, but that does create a space elsewhere, I suppose. Colby Bishop and Katini Yangi are the obvious impact players. Um, Bishop has probably contributed more to the build-up of goals than to actual goal scoring, which is silly considering he's our top goal scorer. 
but he's been involved sort of in secondary assists for so many of our goals. He'll have the ball played up to him, facing away from goal, use his strength to hold off a player and then set off an attack from either Kamara or, or Lane. And uh, it's the sort of thing that Yankee does a bit further up the pitch, actually, in front of a, a back four. In terms of players with a mistake in them, if you can target Sparks in the air, if he plays, then that's what Blackpool did well. So sort of cross-field aerial balls to the left-back position if Sparks is lining up, beat him in the air and win the second ball. He's got a great delivery, really good going forward and has improved defensively. But aerially, you know, you can't be good at everything. Let's be honest, you can't you'd be a master of all trades. And then I guess even though he's getting out of the habit, if you're asking for names, I'd, I'd probably put Sean Raggett in that bracket. He has raised his ceiling. He has had a really good season. But if you put pressure on him in a high press, he's probably the least, or the player I would be least happy having the ball at his feet mm. when there is pressure put on him. Uh, in, in a yeah, the high press putting pressure on Raggett and Norris because we try and play out from the back and we'll quite happily play it across our back four inside our own box is very, you know, start from very very deep, invite the press and then play through it, which they're very good at doing. But if the high press is really well executed, there have been occasions when we get heart in mouth, squeaky tum, bum time moments where, you know, it ends up with a panicky clearance or the ball does get skewed out for a throw in where, yeah, where particularly Norris and Raggett are put under pressure. Norris is actually really good with the ball at his feet and his distribution is excellent. But if you're looking to to create chances, I'd say you're probably going to get it from turnover of possession high up the pitch after a well executed high press that would if we do lose the game i'd expect that to be where we lose it or from just a random set piece it's interesting because um paul warren loves as you know to play that that kind of uh counter offensive as such in in the sense of making a high press very difficult to break down i think one thing that goes against derby in particular this game is that I don't think we have the personnel to do it. Uh, our legs are aging up top, as you know. And I think when you're going to play a higher press, I think teams that have become successful against you have got a very young uh, forward line. We we are in our 30s uh, on most of them. If you, you, know, if you take on the average age of the likes of Dwight Gale, who's injured, Waghorn is back, Collins, who's now back, Connor Washington. You know, you don't expect those kind of players to 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 press against you. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't be too concerned. So what what do Pompey fear of Derby? Do you, do you feel that there's there's any particular player that that scares the living daylights out of you guys, or are you fairly confident that it doesn't matter what we bring, you'll have enough to uh, to, to, to beat it? I mean, we very much don't take anyone for granted in this division. Um, the player who I mean, we've spoken about him on our pod already this afternoon, yeah. yourself and, and me. There's uh, definitely Corey Blackett Taylor from his time at Charlton. I mean, we still have nightmares about some of some of his um, confrontations with Sean Raggett. So uh, that's probably a duel you would want to really try and make the most out of in terms of, you know, identifying uh, one-to-one battles on the pitch. If you can get Corey Blackett-Taylor running one-on-one at Sean Raggett with Raggett sort of backtracking, that's somewhere that, you know, you could have potential success. Having said that, last time out when Blackett-Taylor played against us, um, against Raggett, Raggett did do better. So, you know, maybe he'll have him, you know, in his back pocket this game. But that's a definitely a, a nervy one-on-one confrontation for our, our side of things. I think Mendes Lang again, if he is fit, who knows? I'm trying not to second guess it. I'm going to see who's on your team sheet. But uh, Mendes Lang is a player of, you know, you can't argue that he is a quality player and one of those that can just pull something quality out of out of thin air. Uh, is Conor Hurahan fit at the moment? Um, he is, but he's 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 an aging Conor Hurahan. Mm, I think okay. if, it's, if I think if it's a roll up roll up your sleeves kind of game, he'll go missing. He he was he was he was he's been not great. He he, he splits our fan base every week. Okay, um, I mean maybe I'm thinking about him as sort of whatever rose tinted glasses like uh, you do about relationships from 10 years ago that yeah, weren't as good as you thought they were but yeah when it was at villa when it was at barnes etc then definitely you, you fear him but he, he's not the player that he was so uh mm. and max birds out as well who's probably the better of the two anyway in the middle so mm. 
Um, so I mean, we're, we're very grateful for Sonny Bradley. I mean, we think he's still being a, he's being a, an ex Pompey agent. To be honest with you, he's uh, he's in our good books for getting himself suspended uh, undercover Sonny Bradley. So yeah, shout oh. out to him for that. We're very very appreciative. Um, again, the, the, <laughs> again, a, a player that split the Derby fan base when he when he signed. We, we thought he was going to be the the Messiah, take the captaincy and lead us to the promised land. And he's been probably the most the biggest disappointment that we've had um, this season. Um, he came in, didn't get the captaincy that was given to Conor Hurry, and I think that affected him mentally. Um, and then, well, whatever he was thinking of, as you probably saw against Northampton last game out, has has basically alienated him from probably everyone in the mm -hmm. fan base at the moment. He's not a popular man, and he probably hasn't been seen doing his shopping in in Derby City Centre mm -hmm. recently. So, so just wrapping it up with a couple of minutes to go on the pod. How do you see the game going, uh, result wise? Do you think that uh, this will be a formality or do you believe that uh, no. this could be far more difficult I'm not, than you I'm think? not falling for that trap. Absolutely not. <laughs> My no. games. That's bait and I'm not snapping. Well, I may have just nibbled a little bit there. Um, <laughs> honestly, it sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think a lot of it depends on what happens on Good Friday, which we don't know yet. And your your fans will know when they listen to this. If, if we pick up three points at Wickham, I think that a draw on Tuesday is a, a really decent result for us um, in terms of just sort of maintaining the gap, which is what we need to be doing. If we lose at Wickham, then it maybe moves the goalposts a little bit in terms of what we need to get from that game, particularly if Bolton pick up points on Good Friday and and you guys do, which I do expect you to. So, yeesh. The, the way I think the game's going to go is it sounds like you're going to, from what you've said to, to me this evening, sort of sit deep and then try and break quick. And it's whether or not we can create that moment of quality of playing the ball in someone like Yengi just sitting in front of your back four and then creating something in a split second, which, to be honest, they've done pretty well over the course of the season. I think it's going to be cagey. I think it's going to be nervous because it's a, such a huge game for both sides. And, you know, if touch would if Pompey get three points from it and we beat Wickham then suddenly yeah it's on which is something that I've really tried not to say so far this season because it's such a long season so I think it's going to be cagey I'd imagine we'll probably have more of the possession then and uh probably sit well pass it around the halfway line trying to wait for the opportune moment to to spot a, a gap in your defense or someone out of position and then try and play the ball up to either Bishop or Sadie have one of the wide players overlapping, cutting inside. One incisive ball splits your back four, far corner. Easy, cheers for coming, have a safe trip home. That's the dream. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, that's not what's happening, but that, that's the dream. So, well, I think I think quickly on, on the Derby uh, side of things, I think you'll see a very, I think you'll see Paul Warren change things. He, he, he hasn't had the, the strongest of midfield, and I think he'll go quite physical. I think he'll go in with Smith and, and Adams. I think he'll try and shore things up. I'd be surprised if Hoyhan starts. I don't think he will. I think he'll go for more of a nullify your your attack uh, and go for a smash and grab. So I, I'm going to predict, uh, as I said on your uh, on on your podcast, I'm going to go for a two nil smash and grab. Um, are you sticking to your uh, score prediction that you did on on your cast? I can barely remember what it was, Chris. It was it was a, like a... It was a draw, if I remember rightly. Did I say a draw? Okay, if we beat Wickham, then I think one all draw. And I think if it gets to a sort of the latter stages and it's one all and we've beaten Wickham, yep. I think they'd be content to see it out and not take undue risks. If we lose against Wickham, I think there's more likely to be a result that isn't a draw in our game. So if we lose against Wickham, I'll obviously back us for a win because, you know, that's what people who do podcasts about their teams do. If we lose against Wickham, I'll go with a... A goal by one, that's right, a win by one clear goal. So either I'll, I'll go with a, I'll go with a two one because I think you've got enough quality going forward, particularly if Mendes Lang is back yes. to score. Uh, if we beat Wickham, I think a one or draw is a very possible and likely result. And I don't think we'd take any huge risks and open up any huge gaps at the back in the last 10 minutes trying to push for a winner. Yeah, well, I would, I would probably, if, if you've got his number, give Sean Raggett a WhatsApp and tell him that Blackett Taylor more than likely will be playing. So uh, that'll be an interesting and jewel ahead. So just the final question, it's been it's been a great catching up with you. Who do you see uh, 
succeeding in the battle for the top two and who do you think will win the playoffs? You're determined to get this little nibble of a soundbite that you can play back when we throw it away, aren't you? You're, you're really going for it. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> to put it crassly, as long as we go up, I don't care, Chris. Yeah. I don't care. I'm sick of this league. I'm over it. I'm done. I've done most of the grounds. You know, we've we've got this group chat where I've spoken to everyone for seven years. I'm over it. Um, <laughs> in terms of who I think, I, I mean, looking at Ian Ever at Bolton, I mean, he looks tired and grumpy and you just feel like that's got to sort of emanate its way into the changing room by osmosis somehow. They've also had a lot of games in a short space of time because of their fixture backlog. So I think if anyone's going to disappear backwards at all, I think it'll be Bolton. Peterborough and yourselves have got quite nice comparative run-ins after after your game against us. You've got yeah. quite a nice run-in yeah. in the big picture compared to us. So my my Pompey heart is saying, yeah, we'll we'll be fine. We'll win the league. And then either yourself or Peterborough in second, and we'd have to go with yourself because you've got a four-point advantage over them. Uh, sorry, no, if they win both of their games in hand, you've got a oh, well, one-point advantage. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay. I'm sticking with Pompey and Derby. Okay, I think Bolton um, will fall away, and I think Peterborough will win the playoffs. Ah, interesting. So, um, I sort of agree with you. I think I think Pompey will win the league, as my my prediction was at the start of the season. Uh, I said that on the local radio station and on the podcast. I think we will scrape home second. I don't think we'll scrape home because of our performances. I think that people will fall apart, and we'll just scrape over. I think it'll be the lowest tally ever. Uh, playoff wise, I'm going to go for Lincoln. I think Lincoln are just crazy at the moment, and obviously they brought these Irish lads in over from the Irish Sea, and they now found the form, and perhaps have gone into rehabilitation, got rid of all the Guinness that was in the veins, and now playing yeah. some decent football. So I rate uh, that as a prediction. I like that predicting someone to win the playoffs who's currently not actually in the playoff positions. Always, I'm a way. big fan of that rogue prediction. I like that style. Nice has to be. Andrew, it's been fantastic. Um, it's been great having you come to this evening and hopefully whatever happens, we'll see each other in the championship. Fratton Park's always a great place to go to. You've always been uh, very welcoming and the atmosphere's always been always been incredible. So thanks very much, mate. No, thank you. I mean, I don't think you're the, the row of fans that sort of um, adjoined the Pompey fans at Pride Park like this particularly much. I, I, I got called out by quite a large number of people who wanted to meet me behind the stand afterwards, apparently. But uh, yeah, for the most part, we have a lovely time. So yeah, uh, thanks for your time this evening. It's been been great to chat. No worries. They're just a, they're just the local Scrabble club. They they probably clearly thought you were intellectual and fans of the game of Scrabble. But Andrew, <laughs> thank you very much. That's the latest edition of the Rams Review podcast. And uh, Andrew, just a quick one: if they want to catch you up on your podcast about Pompey, where would they find you? Yeah, so that's great. Yes, yeah, so we've got a preview with with you, obviously coming out this weekend. So we are at PO Forecast on Twitter, um, and we do it for at Pompey News now on Twitter, Instagram, all of those places, you know, the regular Apple Pods, Spotify, the normal normal places. So, yeah, come and have a listen. Brilliant. Andrew, thank you very much for the time this evening. Good luck over the weekend. Do us a favour and uh, beat Wickham and then uh, we'll take your three points. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers.